observable that explains and then unobservable because then we can kind of do previous all our questions know, about right, was there a temperature change right, right, um, right. would have a balance yeah. 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 right you know help um, the physical you know, physical characteristics some, of you know, some sort of where they live with chemical habitat. change chemical change or was something you know, man-made along the river. So would we assume that like before it might just be the river with the fish swimming upstream and then after what is it the excess of the dock and maybe like a little boat yeah. yeah. to the I've totally agree. I'm just saying like with all the things that we were saying are something. All right, well, if we had like a before with like healthy things going on the balance, there you go. Oh, should we put a key then? No, that's okay. Yes, physical characteristics, temperature, or available resources. So, she said little words. Can we write words with question marks? I think so. Temperature, question mark, oxygen, question mark, salinity, question mark. We don't know. So these are the things that could have happened. Yeah. I would say before, I would just write the word balance. Because we want this to represent, we want to say that this was a happy thing. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like that, we could take it out, but it's pencil. You can draw like lots of plants in here. Yeah, lots of water plants and some bubbles. For the oxygen. All places? Wherever it is, well, we're going to write the balance. Same. <laughs> and it fits perfectly. I know. Way. <laughs> oh. Okay. Weather change. Yeah. Or a storm. I mean, you can you can put a possible storm. Well, what if I just write weather, put a check, and then instead of writing weather, you write storm. Ah. And then they match because the same color. Let's put this in, dark, in a dark color, in a color like that you can see. Um, okay. All right, and then um, on this one, maybe we could add clouds because that would be a balance. Some sun, some that. And then on this one, there are no clouds. It's hotter. Oh, yeah, I didn't do it quite the same. <laughs> All right, guys, what if we mix this with like a burn? And then they can show how that changes over time. Like some of yeah, these. Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. okay. Right? Yeah, brown yeah good. Really? <laughs> Less than that. Should we put. Right now, the orange. So we have so what you're going to do as a group after you hang up your poster is take one of the sets of pink post-its and one with yellow the yellow ones, you're going to visit the other posters as a group. So you'll get to see everybody's poster. So what you need to do is on the yellow post-its, write general comments that you might have about the model that you're looking at. One comment per post-it. The pink ones would be any challenging questions. Is there something on that model that you don't quite understand or that you want to ask the people that made it a certain question about it? one question per post-it, okay? So hang them up, leave space. As a group, visit the others, one group per poster. You don't want to be all crowded up. Yellow, general comments, pink, challenging questions, okay? All right, go ahead. I think we might Everything's over there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is live, this is dead. So oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So we like yeah. the checklist. Mm -hmm. Was that supposed to be a most of the vegetation also. Yeah, it looks like it's deliberate. Yeah.
a lot of purple and some brown, then a little purple and no purple. Yeah. So I would say we would like to have a is to get your model, not yet, bring it back to your table with all the post-its. And I want you to look at all the post-its and ask yourself, can I answer those questions? Can I investigate any of those questions? And answer them with your kid hat on. And I want you to look and add some of those questions that might be new to your list of questions that you put together in the big room before we broke out into groups. So if you get that. So you're really going to take a peek at those questions and any comments. So when you look at your model, how clear was it to the other people? Did they understand it? Okay. So go ahead. We're going to give you about five minutes to do that. This one we can investigate more. Let's do what we know for sure, like add in actual. Can we adopt? Can we adapt our poster? I'll put these down as our questions. Well, I can write it on here and then we can ask questions. Because that's climate. Yep. Particular cause. We have our labels as the causes, mm -hmm. right? right? Yep. And then that one could be just a labeling issue. Yep. Labeling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, guess what I mean. mm -hmm. So what did you think about this process? Why? Anybody? It was nice to work in a group and come up with ideas and then to go around and see what other people had come up with. Mm -hmm. um, and then to be able to come back and reflect on our own work and see where we could have done things a little bit differently. Um, or kind of some of the questions that came up with is what we're hoping we get out of like the next lesson. Okay. Um, in terms of the investigation. Mm -hmm. What else? I thought the groups doing feedback was good because it helps you, like when all of you come to a conclusion about what you're putting on the board, you have in your mind and you get the full picture. And when someone else looks, you realize that the parts that are in your brain as the filled in gaps may not be filled in on the paper. So it helps you get a third party perspective of what you may not have clarified on the Great. What else? I think the way the process that we followed with everybody um, will help the students, you know, further reflect on their own work because just like we worked in a group and then we uh, did the class walk and then we were able to process our questions and put them into categories as to things that we assumed people would see on mm -hmm. our model, things that we could have had in, you know, a quick fix and things that we could you know, work on the next day or the next week and things like that. So some good reflection. It's also very hard not to use words, we found. And um, that was a challenge that probably students would feel as well. You know, we used to having everybody write, 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 note notes, but having to be broader, to be more, you know, encompassing is hard. It is, without a doubt. So what does this mean for you as teachers? We're still learning. <laughs> <laughs> so what could you use this for as teachers? Well, you could check for base knowledge at the beginning of a unit, mm -hmm. see what knowledge they have, where are the gaps, and they could ultimately, instead of reviewing the concepts to get them ready for the unit, do this, and it's kind of the students are filling those gaps automatically because they're talking, they're uh, working in small groups, and then you're going around and commenting, and then you can have a small class discussion about it, and ultimately know where your students are overall, and fill any little gaps, and then move on. Mm -hmm. That's true. I hadn't thought of it that way. I was thinking like, oh, halfway, end of. But if you did it in the beginning, it would be a great way to weed out the misconceptions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's a variety of places that you can use models. Now, it all depends on where you'd like to use them. You can use it in the beginning 
to find out what they're thinking. You can use it in the middle as their thinking is refined. You can use it in a, at the end and do a class model. But what we're going to do now is, now that you all have your baseline data, it's time now to think about how you're going to gather some information to add to your model to help solve this problem. Hey, you all have questions. So there's a variety of different things you can do. You can have teacher-directed activities, labs, investigations, where you supply materials, resources, where the kids can then gather some information about what it is you want them to know. And that's probably a good place to start, especially if they're not used to doing things completely on their own. You can have them do some teacher-directed research where you give them the, the websites and maybe some specific questions to look for or their questions and they can then go and investigate that. You can have it more student-centered where they have their questions and you just supply a bunch of materials and let them start investigating on their own. Or you can do the same thing with the internet where you give them websites and let them investigate their own questions. So depending on where they are after you look at this model would depend on what direction you would go as a teacher because there's certain things that you want them to pay attention to. So here's a little background information. Even though you told me it was in the western part of Long Island Sound, did you know exactly where it was? So down on the bottom on the left, this fish kill actually happened in Cos Cobb Harbor. And the Mianus River comes out of New York, comes down through Connecticut and dumps out in that part of Long Island Sound. Up there is a little picture, a little mini picture that shows just how far west it is in Long Island Sound. So think about that as you start doing some research. Here's a bigger picture of Long Island Sound. You've got the Atlantic Ocean, you've got Long Island, you've got the Sound. It's way over there in the corner. Okay? Very important to know where that is. Here are some websites that you can use to gather some information about what might have happened to those fish in Long Island Sound. And hopefully there's at least one person in every group that can get online and start looking at some of these uh, websites. Now the first three websites are facts about Menhaden. Then there's some, um, there's the Long Island Sound study that they're actually collecting real data on the different fish populations in Long Island Sound. It is great anytime you can to have kids use real data, current data. There's um, a, a hypoxia website from the USGS the United States Geological Society. There's also the Connecticut DEEP website. And down at the very bottom is um, a NOAA website. And there's a video on that page that you can look at and watch and see if you can gather information. So the goal of doing these investigations right now is to gather more information to revise your model to represent what really did happen to those fish. Sounds familiar. <laughs> I was thinking that they're like tyrannuses. Yes, they're tyrannuses. Okay, so I'm going to give you about 15, 20 minutes to gather some data, and then we're going to move on to the next part of our journey today. Okay? So after this, yeah, that's a good one. I would want to do some type of activity, probably, especially at a theme school. Mm -hmm. Maybe do water quality, talk about water oh, quality. Because yeah. they think something's in the water, right? Yeah. What do fish need for life? Uh, let's what see called? what this says. Pogies? It's called the pogie. Pogie. Okay. Comb-like teeth, dorsal fin. So they're, they're sideways. It is flattened sideways. So they were flattened out because that's just what they are. They didn't get flattened. Yeah. And they do it between June to September. Okay, and then mine was the very bottom one, state of the coast, N O A A. And they said they talked about hypoxia in dead zones in areas. They focused mostly on Chesapeake Bay, but they related it to Long Island Sound that it's a nutrient pollution, poor dissolved oxygen levels, and it happens every summer, but it's 
and it's increasingly getting worse each summer. Mm. So if you look at die-offs in Long Island oh. Sound, it's uh, so nutrients. highly concentrated close to New York City, less concentrated closer to open water. All right, so it says at least hypoxic dead zones attributed to human activities have been documented along the nation's yeah, coast. That's perfect. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Nutrient pollution. Here's your food web, your marine food web. So you can see after watching the video, kind of explains why the forage fish, which is the menhaden, aren't making it because what's happening to the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. And you can also get into what, what ramifications does it have for other parts of the food web. And you, you could have kids go off into that direction as well to research the other kinds of fish that are and at that same forage fish. What about the other ones? Here's another visual for the kids to look at. And I'll leave you that with a couple of minutes um, to look and see if there's other information that you can gather from that. But you can see that a lot of what you've been researching is part of the concept in that grade band endpoint. Remember that the framework is not a curriculum. The framework is a guide that tells you what concepts the kids need to investigate. You can decide how you want to teach those concepts. So what are some of the things that you can think of that are related to that grade band endpoint for middle school? Or to the grade band for endpoint for grade eight. Cycling of matter. Cycling of matter, food, food webs. webs. What else? Energy transfer. Energy transfer. Uh, molecules. Oh, here we go. You can have dissolved oxygen when you talk about the dissolved oxygen at higher and lower temperatures, right? Models. I mean, not models. Molecules, dissolved oxygen, temperature. Atoms that make up the mm. are cycled or repeated between the living and non-living parts of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. Discussion about reduction yep. Reduction. Mm -hmm. Now what I'd like you to do is to, in your groups is to make another model. Now that you've learned all of this information about your menhaden and the causes of their demise, I would like you to, to make another model. And keep in mind the, the highlighted points and comments you got on your first model so that maybe you can avoid some of those comments on your second model. So this is a conceptual model explaining what happened to the Menhaden based on your research and any other activities you might have done in the classroom with them. Okay, so put your kid hat back on now that you've learned these things and revise your model. So you're going to need to come up and... Get another piece of paper. We're going to work on that till about lunchtime. We'll break for about 12 o'clock for lunch. You're going to add a farm, too. Is there a farm? Is there a farm? Is there a farm? I didn't plan on it. Okay. That way? Okay. One of the things that's part of the framework are something called learning progressions. Learning progressions are what you've been working on today with by the end of grade two, by the end of grade five, by the end of grade eight, by the end of grade 12. And it's for the disciplinary core ideas or the core ideas that you work with. One of the best ways to see that across grade levels, and I thought we were going to have high school people here too and have, have models of that, is what we've done is we've hung all the elementary models first coming down the hallway and then the middle school models. So I know that you just got all settled, but if we could just make a line, we could walk down there, look at all the elementary models and look at how they've progressed in, at the middle school level. Okay, so kind of, we're going to do a gallery walk without writing things down, but just look and kind of notice some similarities, some differences, 
and we're going to have a little discussion about that. Okay, so everybody up, get in line, come with me. All right, if I can have your attention, please. I know we did some debriefing in our individual rooms, but I think it would be really important for us now to share some stuff between grade bands. You know, maybe, yeah, I mean, who would like to start and share some things that maybe you thought about during the morning session, things that you know, just kept popped into your mind? Don't be shy. I like to see the difference in vocabulary for, from the elementary level versus the <coughs> upper grade. Mm -hmm. There's clearly a bit of a jump, but yes. natural progression. Natural progression. What else? And I just thought this how pretty all the elementary school yeah. pictures were. Like, oh, I wouldn't get back to elementary school. <laughs> <coughs> Do you want to share uses and maybe you can compare how maybe middle school teachers might use this method versus elementary teachers? Benefits? Well, we were saying when how you said it's hard to find the resources when you're doing this activity for the younger grades for them to be able to read it. That like we would like we were telling our, our coordinator um, that we would like the time to like as teachers to go research and make like PowerPoint kind of things that they can like look on their iPads and do their research after we've already like made it for their level. Mm -hmm. So we thought that yeah. would be a good like we like to do this, but that resource part is where it got yeah. would be difficult for like first grade. to the second, we noticed that the feedback from other groups helped to improve our own way of expressing our what we, what we learned mm -hmm. as a result of doing some of the research. So we really appreciated that. And we were very careful to look at the questions when we were redoing the second one. You know, people whose questions led us to make a legend, do with this, do with that, because we were getting good feedback from other people. So in terms of community building and getting that kind of feedback from the community is, I think middle school students would like that, you know, working together. Mm -hmm. Because who's, who's the one that's helping them? Their peers. Their peers. Yeah. peers. Yeah. They're very involved in working with their peers and making connections. What else? Kinds of things? That I was going to say, I like how no matter what level it was, it's very student driven. Mm -hmm. So they're really going to be engaged mm -hmm. in what they're doing because it can be well. Yes. And to connect into the Common Core uh, critiquing is very big in the Common Core and unfortunately in the testing. But for kids to be able to critique at this level is something that's very, uh, that they could do and then you could take it and apply it to other areas. It, fit, it fits in naturally there and you could use that for a jumping board of going off into literacy or math or something like that. But this perfectly lends itself to what critiquing is. Go ahead. Go ahead. Me? Oh, I like that it's, uh, it has some con direct, direct uh, connection with science inquiry, because if you, you use this question and this information that you're going to give them very um, deliberately chosen to elicit the kind of questions that you would like, so you can direct the students toward the kind of uh, questions that they can really investigate. Mm -hmm. That was basically the, uh, just reminded me of the engineering um, process that I, I just did a unit on cell membranes and it was kind of, you know, they build one and then they critiqued it and then they built another one based off that. So I thought that was useful and I can incorporate that in other kits that I have. Maybe even do it some, like do a check at the beginning, mm -hmm. middle and end and have them adapt each time. Good idea. I really like Caitlin's idea of using it as an introductory activity because I found 
even as we were sitting here, I started having us ask more questions than when we started looking on the line. It was, it was a natural lead in to wanting to find out the question itself. And just starting with a picture is such, an, is, is such a simple hook, and yet it can be so involved. I thought it was really great. Mm -hmm. A picture, a demonstration, a video, you know, any small little phenomena or event can start you off in the right direction and get the kids asking questions. The next piece to this unit after you use your model to try to identify your observations and, and any questions that you have, and then you do some research, um, you explore different avenues of trying to find information, and then you explain back on your model again using all of that information that you gained from your activities. Then there's an evaluate piece. This is where students evaluate their own learning and the teacher can evaluate student learning and that's for every grade level, not just elementary. You need to create some kind of a performance task to go with this. It lends itself very nicely. What product or variety of products will you or your students choose to show their understanding of the concepts? Stay away from spitting back what the students have learned and focus on having them apply what they have learned to a new situation. That is truly a great way to evaluate whether or not kids understand the concepts. For the elementary level, who only looked at the one piece in Long Island Sound, the, the western part of it, they could investigate whether or not this phenomena could happen in other areas of Long Island Sound. And in order to do, they will have to understand the concepts to be able to gather that information and answer this question, thus showing that they have understood the concepts. So they could then turn around and do some, um, a little bit more research on different areas of Long Island Sound and see if there have been any other fish kills. And what's the difference in the water temperature? What's the difference in the location? What's the difference in how open it is to the ocean or the sea and where it is? And that was a thought but it's taking those concepts now and applying them someplace else. And of course, you always need to create a user-friendly objective scoring rubric. A checklist isn't enough. It's not detailed enough to go with the evaluation. For the middle school one, <clears throat> For the elaborate to focus in on another question, what factors did you discover that may be the potential cause of the Menhaden fish kill? And there was a lot of conversation going on between the oxygen levels and the phytoplankton and the water temperature and what's really causing it and is it nitrogen, is it the fertilizer, when do they fertilize, what time of year it is, all of these questions. So then I would like to direct you to since middle school, and we focus in on Connecticut and Long Island Sound, is there a man-made place along Long Island Sound that may contribute to the rise in the water temperature that could potentially cause a fish kill? Does anybody know where that is? <laughs> and this would then have kids use the information that they learned about hypoxia and what happened in that part of Long Island Sound, and since temperature was one question that came up over and over and over again as being one of the causes, well, could that happen over there in Millstone? Why or why not? So again, another picture, where is it? What effect does it have? There's where it's located. You want to get into the engineering piece of the practices. They need to understand how a power plant works and functions and if, in fact, that power plant is going to have an effect on the water temperature of Long Island Sound. And it depends on what kind of power plant it is. So. Um, there's, on here, there's a tides and current from NOAA.gov. This is um, a great resource for even elementary teachers if you wanted to look at the water temperature on the western part of Long Island Sound. Um, it plots it out. You can pick it for different places in Connecticut. There's New London, New Haven, and Bridgeport. So you can click on one of those, and New Haven is, or go to New London, which is over there, on, more on that area. You can pick what month it is, what day it is, what year it is, and you can click on that, and it's going to come up with temperature data of the water. So you could go back to 1988 in the Bridgeport station and find out what the water temperature was in that part of Long Island Sound. And you can also keep track of looking at the different temperatures by the power plant. 
Uh, there's also some over here in this limit on fish catch. There's also some legislation that's out there on how much, how many of the menhaden or different kinds of fish that people are allowed to catch commercially. Because I discovered in doing research that the menhaden fish are used for a lot of different products that we consume as consumers. There's the Millstone Power Plant here. There's how a power plant works. So this is just a jumping point of where to get kids started. Yes? We've got a couple of other factors here to throw in. We just were between the energy people and the water people over here in the corner saying, OK, it's not just about millstone. And we don't want to leave you with the idea that it's just a millstone issue. You've got other, what do we count, six power plants along the, the yeah, coastal please. area. And that's just on the Connecticut side, not including the, mm -hmm. the Long Island side. That, that may have some impacts along there. You also have shallow rivers and many of them that feed into the sound. Shallow water is going to get warmer quicker. So all that input of water from Connecticut, basically, what is it, like 99% of the water that falls on Connecticut ends up in our sound. There are a couple of little outlier corners that don't. Um, so shallow water input. Yeah. And the sound is basically a bathtub. It's on <coughs> average 60 feet to yeah. 70 feet deep. It's very shallow. It's, it's a photic zone. Light effect gets down to nearly the bottom of that in some way or another. So it's a shallow bathtub. And in the summer, it doesn't mix. There's been a, there's a if you look up hypoxia in Long Island Sound, mm -hmm. you'd find a whole plethora of information that they literally kind of stumbled on it in the 80s that they started really taking uh, temperatures across the year and they found that the water just doesn't mix in the summer so we have a lot of issues in Long Island Sound so this is this could be part of it but just know there's a lot more that everybody all the kids can investigate and we can all investigate. Yeah, that, just the amount of questions that would be generated, like we did from the very first picture which was extremely simple, this is a far more complex <coughs> issue. That, some of them are can geography be. and some yep. of them are human and mm -hmm. certainly some of the geography is impacted by the human. And that's why it's an ecosystem because it's, you know, there's so many inputs. You can't just kind of, it's hard to pin it on one thing. There's so many things going on. And this is just another list of um, websites I found that had different kinds of facts that might not have been in your particular PowerPoint slide, but it, it's put together. How does what we did fit into the 5E model? There's not a whole lot of documentation out there. How many of you are familiar with the 5E model of instruction? <coughs> okay, the 5E model of instruction is just what it is, 5Es. I like it as a useful tool to organize my thinking around planning a unit. It can certainly be used for a lesson, but it's a great way to start thinking about planning a unit. The engage part, which initiation might be a more familiar word to some of you, is to begin with some kind of a phenomena or a problem or a really thought, thoughtful question or an open-ended question or a video or a picture or demonstration. Construct the model like you did this morning. This can serve as a reference point for the unit, some place for the kids to begin, or a pre-evaluation of student knowledge that you can use as well. The explore part are the scaffolded activities, student-centered activities, whether you plan them or you give them materials to investigate things on their own. Labs, investigations, research. The explain part is to use that information that they learned to revise their model or do presentations and have discussions, use argument, and in science, that's having a discussion and having to use evidence. Everything on your model was evidence-based. It was stuff that you found, information you found through your research, the second model. Um, so we want kids to understand that in order to explain things that they have to back up their explanations with evidence. The elaborate part is applying information to a new situation, a new phenomena, a new situation, another question. It could be your question. It could be a question that they come up with that you approve, especially for the older kids. And it's a great way to let them go off on their own and really get motivated into finding out something that they want to look at. 
And the evaluate is a performance task where the students can demonstrate that understanding of the concepts aligned with the framework and NGSS, and you need an objective scoring rubric. Exploring the framework book. How many of you have actually died, don't, have you poked your nose into this book other than, so how many feel that they're really familiar with it? How many think they need a little bit of guidance? All right, let's do a little bit of guidance. I'm just going to talk about certain parts of the book so that you can either put a post-it there, and I, I've got some up here. If anybody needs post-its, you can put a post-it there, or you could put a, some kind of a bookmark so that you know where you can find the stuff and reference it. There's more up here if anybody needs post-its. Oh, Marge, can you get me some? Sure. Okay, on page page 50 is a chart of the science and engineering practices. I'll also show you where they are on NGSS later on the website. They are also there. I like this chart because it gives a nice summary of what each of the science and engineering practices are. Later on in the chapter, it breaks it down specifically into what that is and what the goals are for, for grades K-12 on these practices. The practices are the same for science and engineering mostly, except the purpose might be different for engineering than it is for science. But other than that, the practices are pretty much the same. Many of them match the inquiry skills that we currently have in the Connecticut standards. Some are brand new. Developing and using models is brand new. Analyzing, interpreting data, or let's see, constructing explanations and designing solutions, engaging in argument from evidence and communicating information. Some of them are related, some of them build more upon than what we already have. What I'd like you to do is think about very briefly, people sitting at your table, two minutes, look at the science and engineering practices that are here and see if you've used any of them today since we started our modeling activity this morning. And if so, where did you use it? Two minutes, maybe three. Okay, first practice. Asking questions and defining problems. Did we do that today? Yes. Where? At the, at the very beginning. Is that the only time we did that? No. All the way through. You were asking lots of questions. Developing and using models. We did yep. that. Planning and carrying out investigations. Yes. Sort of. We did research. We didn't really do an investigation with variables. If you had planned an activity, then yes, you could certainly put that in there as part of those. Um, analyzing, interpreting data. A little. Depending on the resource, resource that you chose, yes. If we had more time and you develop this for your classroom, you can certainly add that piece to it. You want to share what you were talking about? I could listen to you talking about your data. Oh, about adding data. We were saying yeah. if we took the, what we started with, with the pictures today, and then kind of added some quantitative meat to it so they could then go online and actually look up the temperatures and graph the temperatures at that time and maybe take a look at the populations and there were measurements of how many fish were there before and during the dead zone so you could actually take the ideas that they put on paper to start with and then actually find the hard data that go with it. 
And then that's what you can kind of add in your evidence to piece your evidence, yes. That's sort of the quantitative stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that could go into using math and computational thinking. So if we had, if you did integrate that data, you could put that piece in it as well. Constructing explanations and designing solutions. I think you touched on constructing the explanations. You did not design solutions. That could have been an engineering piece if you wanted to tie that in. Uh, but you certainly were gathering information to at least start talking about things that might have caused that massive fish kill. Engaging in argument from evidence. I heard yes, I heard no. Yes, where? Defending your poster. In your own groups. The model, you had to use evidence. If you carried this through, all the way through the performance task, you could certainly include presentations of students presenting what they found with their evidence and have that discourse going on, not just in writing with post-its, but verbally. Obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. You did, and how did you communicate it? On your models. So there's many ways that you can do that. So it's not limited to just a certain, a certain way, but there's many different ways. Page 83 of your framework book are the cross-cutting concepts. And they're listed on page 84 and explained in the following. And I think, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Holly. Holly, you were talking about cause and effect and patterns. Those are all cross-cutting concepts that are really integrated throughout the framework in many different areas. So it's nice if, you're, if you can integrate this kind of vocabulary and get the kids to know that these are patterns that we're looking at. This is a cause and effect event that we wanna, we wanna explore. So you're adding that just as a matter of fact. <laughs> and it's all throughout the framework. Um, the cross-cutting concepts, and if you want to know more about them, you can read about them in the following pages and what that looks like as it progresses over the grade bands. Again, those progress. The disciplinary core ideas are on page 103. They begin there. And the first one are the physical science ones on page 105. It's a nice little chart. There are four core ideas, and each core idea is broken up into three or four separate sections. Uh, one that's new for Connecticut is the last one, WAVES and their application in technologies for information transfer. That's brand new. The next core idea are the life science core ideas, and that chart is on page 142. And again, there's four life science core ideas that run from grade K through 12. One thing that I'd like you to take notice of is we worked today on one of the sub pieces of the LS2, Ecosystems, Interactions, Energy, and Dynamics. We focused in on C, LS2C. But as you were asking questions and different things were coming up and some of the resources I added really took in LS2A, the interdependent relationship in the ecosystem, as well as cycles of matter and energy transfer in that ecosystem. Remember that these are all connected. It, so whenever you can make those connections across those core ideas, the better it is for the kids to be integrating them in, in total context instead of looking at each one separately. So we really did touch on three of those. And if we got into the social interactions and group behavior, I'm sure we could have done that in part of the performance tasks if you wish to do that. After the life science ones are the earth and space science ideas. Those are on page 171, the list of them. 
There's three core ideas, Earth's place in the universe, Earth systems, and Earth and human activity. And last but not least, there is a disciplinary core idea in engineering technology and applications of science. And the box is on page 202. It starts with some definitions. And then on 203, there are two core ideas for engineering. Engineering design and then links among engineering technology, science, and society. So that's just a little walkthrough of where things are. We already talked about learning progressions earlier today. So how do we use all this stuff? What does this mean? Next gen, science standards. How many of you, when you go to this website, go, ah, I don't know how to use it. Let's take a look at it. When I go to the next generation science standards, I immediately can look over here at the appendices. Now, Appendix A <coughs> these are the conceptual shifts in the standards. The first one is that science education should reflect the interconnected nature of science as it is practiced and experienced in the real world. Do as scientists do. Integrate those three dimensions of the framework. The next one is that their student, the next generation science standards are student performance expectations, not curriculum. You cannot take this document and use it as your curriculum. It needs a lot of work before that can happen. The concepts in NGSS build coherently from grade K to two. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading this. I just want you to know where it is. Focus on deeper understanding of content as well as application of content. No more spitting back facts and memorizing things to take tests, but really digging deep into it to understand the concepts and core ideas. Science and engineering are integrated from K-12. They're designed to prepare students for college career and citizenship. NGSS and Common Core State Standards are aligned. And I'll show you what that looks like. Now, you can view NGSS by the disciplinary core ideas, or by topics, or by performance expectations. And it's really a matter of preference. I like to go by the disciplinary core ideas because then I can match them up with the framework. So today, here are all the disciplinary core ideas. There's physical science, life science, earth space science, engineering. You could click on one of these or you could pick a grade level, a grade band. So let's look at grade three, five, do a search, and here are all the grade three, five, grade three, four, and five. Where's our Ellis? Here's in fifth grade. This is one of the main core ideas that we focused on today. So what does this look like? And you can click on all these areas up here to get explanations in case you, want, you don't quite understand. It lists the science and engineering practices. Developing a model to describe phenomena is a focus for this core idea, which is right here. Interdependence, relationships, and ecosystems. It gives you information here as well as here. It came from here. That's where it came from. It came from this book. This was the precursor to the NGSS. And here's the cross-cutting concepts that you should stress with this particular what these core ideas is system system models but again we also did cause and effect and we looked at patterns over here it tells you what other DCI's this is our LS2A DCI which other ones are related to this one it tells you here there's an earth science 2A and a physical science 1A that also are connected to this DCI 
So you can see this is a very complicated document. Over here is how this, these, this DCI is disaggregated across, articulated across the grade levels, goes into middle school. Here's your common core, literacy and math. So it's telling you which of the literacy and math common core state standards can fit with this particular standard. Teaching pedagogy is changing to be more open-ended, more student-centered, more concept-focused instead of factoids. I like to start with the Connecticut standard and then if you'd like to get suggestions on the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts, you can go to NGSS and find the standard there, one that best matches if you want suggestions for that and Common Core. But you should really be looking at this document because this document has all the information you need for that particular connection to match it up with the state and, and with the national, with the framework. And it gives you the grade band endpoints. And that's important to know what your kids should know when they come into this and where you're going with it by the end of your grade band and where they're heading even further than that. We didn't touch on the high school piece today, but the high school piece was um, more complicated in, in the amount of research and the, and the concepts that they were looking at, and they were going to apply their concept of what was happening with hypoxia to different parts of the United States and the world, which would have tied into the Gulf of Mexico and making connections. So all of that can come from here. This came first, chicken before the egg. This came first and then NGSS. No, we're not gonna do that. Does anybody have any questions? Laurel, do you wanna make any comments? Yeah, looking at that last search that you just did, it said the reading standard is there really is your fuel, I think, for, gee, I don't have time for science, or somebody's telling me you don't have time to do science, because we really want you to concentrate on these common core skills. It's like, no, but I am doing that thing. See, it's here, it's clearly aligned, it's, you know, I'm spending the time, I'm doing what I need to do, and the kids get it. So very much so, use this document to support you when you're creating good, strong, integrated, cross-disciplinary lessons, it is there. It is very much there. You need to do some work to get it there, of course, and to, to spend significant time with your kids to make sure they're doing that. But I was seeing that in both rooms, looking back and forth, were you doing the research and the reading and reading um, uh, non-fiction texts, all of the stuff that many schools are struggling with, where do we fit that in? You know, if I told you, here's a lovely textbook, go read it, you're going to say, oh my gosh, you know, thank you, that's why I left school. Um, our kids don't want to do that any more than you do, but would you have if you were back in a fourth, fifth, sixth grade classroom or in here in the, uh, the middle grades and you were looking up information about the Minhaid and you were tripping into all kinds of articles that you probably wouldn't have picked up yourself, but you needed to know. You wanted an answer. Your kids are very much the same way. You can drive them back to those, those documents that you're trying to get a hold of that you're trying to get them to be using. And how do I show that in the math? I need a graph to, to show my temperatures or my changes. There was data for that. So you're, you're integrating those skills that you're trying to do because they need it to answer the question. They want it to answer the question. They will demand it to answer the question. They will. Who here was, but I want an answer. I, I heard that in a couple of places, but why? 
What's the real answer? Tell me why your kids are going to be even more so, probably especially that middle grades bunch or the middle grade thinking bunch. They think everything should be black and white, but they don't want any black and white, you know, applications to them. But there ought to be an answer for that. So it'll drive you a little nuts, it'll drive them a little nuts, but get over it, that's life. Yeah, and one more thing about the practices is you don't have to integrate every single practice oh, yeah. in every single unit and every single thing that you do, but that you integrate them over the course of the year multiple times. Physical science core ideas are much easier to build models around many times to, to do experiments and investigations to look at variables to collect data to argue from evidence than perhaps the topic that we worked on today. So always keep your eye out for being innovative and how you can you know hook those kids in and give them those common core experiences at the same time and before they know it they're going to be jumping right into them and not even knowing that they're jumping right into them. Yes. Uh, just one comment for those of you who actually are teaching science. Uh, several months ago, the State of the Department of Ed did a content crosswalk, and it's on the State Department of Ed website. So you can look at the Connecticut science frameworks, and you can see what Connecticut does that aligns with NGSS and where, the, where we're lacking, for lack of a better term. Um, I can send that to you. Can send We've it got it on Blackboard oh, already. Perfect. You will yep. get there. It's coming. Okay, I have to show it to them if you want to. But if you go to the Connecticut State Department of Education website, go down to curriculum and click on the little microscope that's there for the science. It, the crosswalks are there, the charts are there, so you can see the alignment between Connecticut and NGSS uh, and the framework. Connecticutcurriculum.org on that website? I go to the Connecticut State Department of Education, SDE. Dot org and then to the right hand side and on the bottom it says curriculum teaching and learning and then curriculum. dot org yeah. okay. and then science okay. you don't think I can actually remember no that didn't work remember the Google. I Google everything I'm a Connecticut State Department of Education, and then let's open this up. Come down here to teaching and learning, over here to the microscope, and um, here's the next gen standards. Here's the content review committee. That's the framework, adoption, implications. Here's the crosswalk right here. Right, just the core ideas, the DCIs, the stuff that's in the middle. So it's, it's compared by grade bands, by content area. It explains. One of the profound things that came out of this when they did the crosswalking and looking at this, it's not what you're teaching that is going to change, it's how you're teaching it that will need to change. You were. We, Connecticut was pretty well aligned. What is it? Something like 85 or 90 percent of it was a decent alignment. What we we had in there was there, but we were not arguing yeah. with evidence we to were a not certain doing degree. A darn thing with yeah. with modeling as this is considered modeling. You learned about modeling, and we weren't doing anything to speak of with engineering and technology because you know what you've had to add in your classes in your school to do that. And that is hand in hand with every piece of this new framework. So that's really the single biggest difference there. It wasn't that, but I used to teach about ecosystems. Yep, ecosystems is in there. I must be good. No, it's how did I teach about ecosystems? And it's not just taking what you currently have and sticking the practices in them. You need to redesign your activities to match the practices. It is a teaching difference.
to How many anything. here have gotten <laughs> inquiry training? How many here would, I, how would you compare what we did today with where you were with inquiry? Go ahead. I think I'm very familiar with I, I work at an international baccalaureate school, so we're all inquiry based, transdisciplinary through math, science, social studies, English and other arts. Pretty much IB is all day, where we integrate inquiry throughout the whole day. So this is, I'm very comfortable with what we did today. This is what I've been doing for the past couple of years. It's really the same. Okay. Is this a step up from straight up inquiry though? Or at least where you started when you started doing inquiry, maybe? The, the way we work is we make sure we fit in the standards, so I guess so, because the standards are changing. Yep. But, and I'll just speak as a person who has a pretty strong background in science. Inquiry, I don't think, encapsulated the way science is actually done. It encapsulated part of it. The practices and the cross cutting concepts really encapsulate how science is actually done in the real world now, as opposed to the inquiry. Having gone to an inquiry training session, one of the things that, well, the, one thing that drove me crazy was we need an, investig an investigable question. And so we got the investigable question, we designed the procedure, but as the world said before, we didn't answer the question at the end. And a scientist would never do that. So. It's just, it's, it's a much more um, fluid, dynamic, all-encompassing the way science is actually done model. Because the framework, this was written by scientists, by learning scientists. This is all the content and stuff. Uh, and then everything got translated by professional educators and others into instances. In terms of, if, if in the framework at the very beginning, intro ch chapter or maybe this, I don't know if it's chapter one of the, the preface, it talks about why aren't we using the word inquiry anymore? And basically their explanation is inquiry isn't gone, it's just better, more precisely described. And if you look at the next, or the National Science Education Standards, which were the national standards that came out in 96, they talked about, they really emphasized inquiry as a method of learning and a method of doing science. Mm -hmm. And you know, from, from both sides, both teaching and learning. And then in the year 2000, they decided, oh, we better write a book, a whole book that just explains inquiry. And uh, the biggest takeaway in that book is the five essential features of classroom inquiry. Five of the eight practices can be paraphrased from the framework. Five from the into the framework. So it's like there's three sort of new things. Modeling is one of them that that sure some of us did when we were teaching an inquiry lesson but it wasn't like focused on and the other one was argumentation and the other one was claims and evidence kinds of things communication yeah well the communication was in there it was still the fifth thing that had to happen and basically what the old inquiry book said is you can't call it inquiry unless you do all of these parts in a lesson or in a unit, okay, whatever your unit of instruction is. So it was a way of deciding, were you teaching a piece of inquiry or were you really teaching through inquiry? And now, with the practices, they aren't saying, oh, it can't be NGSS unless you do all of these things in a particular activity because some of them make sense in one subject area more than another subject area at that grade level. Now, once you get right. to graduate level, yeah, every, all scientists and engineers are probably bouncing around through all of those. But uh, there's really a strong relationship, and if you want to read more about it, I do recommend that first chapter about why not inquiry. Mm -hmm. 